right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome in. We are all about bringing conservation, science, and adventure to classrooms around the world. And I want to say thank you. I've been saying this all month long. Uh, thank you to all our teachers for joining us. We know that September is an absolutely crazy month for you all. It looks totally different. It's been totally different. And so we appreciate you spending some of your time with us as we continue to highlight amazing people from around the globe. So two notes about this presentation before we dive in. First, our whole month has been dedicated to ocean plastic. So we have done 20 plus programs featuring uh, adventurers, scientists, researchers from around the world, highlighting this issue of ocean plastics, which is hugely top of mind uh, nowadays. Uh, I love it because it's a totally apolitical issue. No one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes, great. You know, we all want to do our part for this. We all want to clean up. We all want to find out what the problem is and the scale of it. And so uh, today you guys are going to get a chance to do just that. And secondly, this marks our second last of the month uh, high school focus session. So we've always done programs for all ages, K through 12, but this year we are focusing specifically uh, on sessions for high school students, highlighting STEM careers, sort of how you get involved in some really cool roles. And uh, I hope you guys are as inspired as I am by Anna's presentation today. So uh, as I said, Anna's joining us, Anna Robux joining us. She has done a number of presentations with us in the past. And today she is gonna literally dive into the belly of the beast with a presentation on uh, doing a live seabird by section to look for plastic, see what's going on, see the problem, and uh, hopefully, and you know, as, as firsthand as you can possibly do it. So Anna, thank you so much for joining us today, and I can't wait, so let's take us away. Hi everyone, welcome. I am so happy that I'm able to join you all this morning. Thank you, Jesse, and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for having me. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. Today we're going to be walking through uh, a quick seabird dissection. So, uh, Jesse, to confirm, do you guys see me or my slides right now? Right now, I see you, and I can bring up your slides whenever you'd like. Slides would be great. Perfect. Let's do it. You're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, for for folks, uh, just to orient everyone um, on the right of the slide, I have just a map. Um, Rhode Island is that little red state on the U.S. East Coast. Um, I am at the University of Rhode Island, so the state university there. And I work a lot with Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary as a NOAA Nancy Foster Scholar. This is a, a scholarship through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that uh, connects STEM students with protected area sites to conduct science in support of those sites. And so on the left here, I help out with some of their seabird tagging efforts. And I myself study seabirds and what kind of pollutants that they end up uh, reflecting from their environment. So a lot of us have seen these really kind of grisly images of, of seabirds chock full of plastic. And this is an image from um, Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument, um, another part of the, the sanctuary system um, of the National Marine Sanctuary Office. And this, this is all too common. And unfortunately, what I hope to show you all today is that when these birds are eating plastic things, they don't see, you know, like a, a plastic Tupperware container or a plastic bottle. They see little tiny fragments or kind of pieces of, of plastic products that they can mistake for food. They don't look like plastic products once they spend some time in the environment. This is a real problem though, because seabirds can readily eat too much plastic and like this bird, they can die very readily. Um, beyond that though, it can also just cause problems without killing them in terms of blocking their stomach, um, introducing chemicals into their system that are from the plastics, all around bad situation. So I specifically look at plastics in this type of bird. It's called a great shearwater. It is a long-lived seabird that breeds in the South Atlantic, just a little bit north of Antarctica, and then comes up and hangs out in Massachusetts Bay over our summer. And Massachusetts Bay is, is this really protected region that supports thousands and thousands and thousands of these birds. And so these birds are a really good indicator for the kind of Atlantic system overall because they're entirely reliant on the Atlantic Ocean in the south and in the north to um, support, support their livelihoods. So when we look for plastics in these birds, we're kind of getting like a pulse on what sort of plastics the Atlantic Ocean is contributing into marine food webs. 
This is really important as an indicator overall of where ocean plastic is in the environment. And seabirds are particularly great indicators of this because they have a lot of kind of characteristics that make them good sentinels. We call them a sentinel species. So as I just mentioned, they're global citizens. In the case of the Great Shearwaters Eye Study, they live across this wide expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. We have, uh, I'll show you in a second, we have some cool tracking data that tells us where they are. So we know where they are across this, this region. And if a scientist were to kind of try to sample across the entire Atlantic Ocean, it would be so expensive and probably not doable to take really um, integrated samples across that whole region. So instead, by looking at seabirds that rely on the whole region, we, we get a good picture of what's there. They're also sensitive to pollution and sensitive to their environments. Some of you may have heard the phrase canary in the coal mine. Birds are, they respond quickly to kind of stress in their environment or good conditions in their environment. So this means that they're, um, when, when we look in this seabird, we're not looking at plastics from like, you know, 100 years ago. We're looking at conditions in the here and now, which is really important, again, for this idea of a sentinel species or, or keeping a pulse on plastics in the area. They are long-lived, though, so they have opportunity to kind of grow and develop and mature, um, which is also important because if, if they were a, a short lifespan, they have less of an opportunity to kind of integrate conditions across across their habitat area. So as I mentioned, I work on this problem with the Great Shearwaters in uh, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. This is a really productive region that's home to a lot of whales and seabirds and sharks and fisheries um, and is considered a, a special place in, in the U.S. because of this. This seabird flocks around a lot of whale aggregations as well. So when we are gaining information about what's in birds. We're also gaining information about what's in fish, what's in whales. Um, it's it's a, a great, again, sentinel or indicator of the system. So as I mentioned, um, the program I work with is responsible for deriving a lot of tracking data from these, these great shearwaters. We put satellite tags on their back. In that first picture I showed you of me, I was holding a bird with a satellite tag on its back. And so we know where they're hanging out in the Massachusetts Bay and Gulf of Maine region. And this tells us, so when I get a dead one at the end of the summer, um, I know where kind of where it's been over the past couple months because we have tracking data about so much of, um, of the population to say, okay, well, they're here and kind of in the south at the beginning of the summer and then they move north and then they move back south. And so that means when I look at the plastics in this bird's stomach, I know like, okay, roughly where this could have came from. When I started out this project, someone had looked at a handful of great shearwaters before me in the early 2000s, and they found that 71% of those birds contain plastic fragments, which is a lot, but some scientific research has suggested that as plastic production increases, which it is currently doing, it's expected to quadruple by 2050. And as that production increases, the amount of plastic in seabirds also increases commensurately or, or at the same time. And so what we found, actually, sorry, let me go back. What we have found to date is I've cut up about 400 different great shearwaters, and I have found plastic in 98% of them meaning from the beginning of the 2000s compared to now, the birds have a much higher ingestion frequency of plastic fragments. They're dominated by hard fragments from user products, which I will show you here in a second. And we think that these birds are eating them directly from their environment, not getting them from their prey. Their prey are a tiny fish, maybe about this big, so the fragments that we find in the birds are a little bit too big for them to be coming from the food that they're eating. So at this point, I am going to, um, I guess, Jesse, if I could stop presenting and I'll jump into the, um, the necropsy part of this. This is my favorite part. So I am going to show you um, how I get all this information from the birds. 
As Jesse mentioned, uh, my Wi-Fi is not great. We're having storms here in Rhode Island today. So um, if you want to see something that is maybe not close enough or you can't quite make out, um, if you could put it into the chat box and maybe Jesse call that out to me so that I can be sure to hold up whatever it is or, or bring the computer a little bit closer. Um, so with that Absolutely. said, let me get set up here and see what we can do. All right, so um, can you guys, can everyone see a dead bird? We, okay. Yeah, we, we, sort of, we, we see the shape of it. We see that we, we've cut it open and we're, we can dive in. And uh, again, it's a little uncrisp, but that's not the end of the world. We'll hope for the best. And if anyone does have any queries and wants to see something closer, please do let me know in the chat bar. We'll bring it up closer okay. to the camera. I'm gonna lift it up right now, just to get it a little bit closer to start. So, um, for folks who maybe don't like blood, you might need to close your eyes for some of this, but hopefully we'll, we'll get past that. I went ahead and opened up the bird so that we can kind of get started right away. When you perform this necropsy, we really rely on doing a complete visual assessment of the bird. So I'm gonna put this down to, to just show you a little bit more and I'll pick things up as we need. Um, when we start out, we, we start by doing external measurements on the bird's beak. And so this entails measuring this portion of the beak called the culmen. We measure how long its wings are. We check out its fat, and I'm gonna lift this up one more time. So let me grab a pointer here. Um, over here, this white stuff that I'm kind of picking up and holding that's all fat. The bird is lined with fat. These birds rarely come to land. They live entirely on the ocean. They sleep on the ocean, they, they feed on the ocean. And so they have these really, really big lining of fat on the inside of their um, chest cavity and just throughout their body to help keep them warm. So one of the things we measure when we open them up is how thick their fat is. We do that, let me, I'll just show you real quick here. Um, we do that using this instrument called a caliper. It's just a, a fancy tool to make sure that we get um, accurate measurements. We take that piece of fat and we grab a measurement. I have 3.58 millimeters of fat on this bird, it's pretty good. So it was probably a, a decently healthy bird. When we get birds that are really unhealthy, it'll be maybe close to one millimeter or, or even less. You can't even barely see it. Um, so from there, let me move forward and take you kind of inside the bird now. So this, um, move that over, okay. So here is the bird's rib cage, has really big pectoral muscles. This is what the bird uses to fly. Um, underneath the rib cage, actually, let me grab, let me grab an, another lab mate to uh, help assist here. Hey, will you help me? Thanks. Yeah. Will you hold up the... Um... So if you, yeah, there we go. If you, will you bring that, okay, will you bring it a little closer? Let's angle down. Okay, so hopefully that's a little closer for everybody. Um, so we open up the the rib cage, and I think for you guys, this is gonna mostly just kind of look bloody. That's because it kind of just is. I'm gonna point out some of the key features. Um, we have the bird's esophagus and proventriculus. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, this is the bird's windpipe or trachea. We check that to make sure that there's no kind of um, parasites or fungus in there. Um, we also, I'm going to open this up a little further. Um, right here, we got the bird's liver. Let me take that out and hold it up so everyone can see it. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, no. My Siri just started talking I'll to me. If you want. Hey, Siri, cancel. Hey, Siri, cancel. Always when you least expect it. Yeah, te technical difficulties.
Okay, so um, I'm gonna hold hold this up close. I think everyone should be able to see that. It's just kind of a, a, a sack, um, amorphous when you take it out of the body, but you'll notice that the liver has two lobes to it. I hold it up so you can see that. So there's, there's two lobes. Um, we take a weight on this liver to figure out um, how healthy, again, the bird was. By taking a bunch of organ weights, you get a good sense of how big the bird was, how healthy it was. And then I also take this liver and I look for chemicals in it, um, different types of new and old chemicals to figure out what, what sort of, of chemical pollutants the bird has in addition to plastic pollutants. So now that the liver's out, and this is probably the most exciting part, um, I'm going to go ahead. I already started to open this up for us. I'm going to keep taking it out for us. Let's see. Can you? Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the bird's ventriculus and proventriculus. And right now I'm just kind of flushing things out of this area. And I will hold this up so everyone can see a little bit better. Thank you so much for holding that. Oh, cool. I have uh, my boyfriend and excellent lab assistant is helping me right now <laughs> um, hold, hold up the, uh, the computer. So thanks to him. He's also a whale tagging researcher at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So I think his, his stuff is pretty cool, maybe even cooler than mine, but I, I'm biased, I don't think so. Well, two notes on that. First of all, a love built on dissections is bound to last. And secondly, if he ever does a session, you can be his lab assistant, okay? We'll make that happen. There we go, there we go. I like that. <laughs> okay, so. You're spraying your laptop with blood. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, okay, so we can't do that. Okay, so. Now, we've got everything out of this bird's bottom portion of the stomach. This is what it looks like when it comes out. Hang tight for just a second, and I'm going to take out the whole stomach to show you what that looks like. Fantastic. While you're doing that, Anna, what I've done in the comment section of YouTube, and I'll share it with our live classes as well, is again, it is a bit blurry today. It's unfortunate. Uh, so what I've done is linked uh, the classes to some of one of your last broadcasts, or it was crystal clear video, so that if people want to see some of these organs up close, it, it's not the exact same dissection, of course, but it is similar, and you can check that out if you want to see things in, in all their glorious detail. Okay, so I am now holding um, the bird's entire stomach. Um, since it's kind of blurry, I'm assuming you guys hear, or excuse me, see just kind of a long pink tube. Um, at the top of this tube, this is a really flexible part where I'm pointing to. This blows up like a balloon for the bird to be able to eat as much as possible. This portion at the bottom that I'm, I now am holding up in two fingers, it's kind of gonna just look like a pale sack to, to you guys. Um, this is called the bird's gizzard or ventriculus. This is a muscular organ that I just cut open to get out the plastic bits from, um, from the bird. So the bird kind of gorges itself on fish and squid in the flexible part. And in the, the bottom portion, this muscular portion called the gizzard, this is where the bird tries to grind up bones and squid beaks, and it often gets filled with plastic though because they are eating such a significant amount of plastic. And so this little tiny organ, you can, um, so it's it's about, when it's full, it's about that size. It's, it's very small, um, the size of maybe an American half dollar, um, and yet it can be packed with up to 200 pieces of of plastic. And so now that I've kind of shown you an outline of what this looks like, we don't look for plastics in the, the flexible portion, just a side note before I forget. We don't look for it up here because shearwaters actually throw up a lot when they get stressed or they're, they're trying to kind of like get lighter so they can take off of the water. They throw up. And so this portion, the flexible kind of like balloon-like part portion, not as useful. So we really just look for plastics down in this later portion where um, the muscular portion that is, is a lot smaller. 
So um, I'm going to put a little more water in our plastic sample here. So I uh, flushed out the ventriculus to see what was what was in there that we could see. And I'm guessing because of the, the bandwidth issues, you might not be able to see in close detail. So I'm gonna pick up some things um, and hopefully show a little bit better. So right here, this is a piece of plastic that just came out of that bird's ventriculus um, that I just flushed out. Looks like an, another piece right here. Let me pick that up better. There we go. Another piece right here. This is kind of an orange fragment. Another piece, this is looks like it's probably a portion of a balloon. It's kind of soft and, and flexible. And a couple little pieces floating around in here as well. This, I don't think you'll be able to see. We've got a little, little tiny thing on the end, end of my tweezer. And so I do this to show you guys that when the bird is looking for food in the environment, it does not see a plastic bottle. It does not see, um, you know, a food package container. It sees these little tiny fragments, and this is what it eats. And so, it's really, really important to focus on waste reduction and waste management. In that, these they're they're not they're not subject to like whole plastic pieces um, during during this process. So. Um, I want to also show you guys a few other samples that I have um, collected as well that have more plastics in them. And these might, there we go. oh, yeah, got one. These will also show you that uh, the plastic that they see is not a plastic like you and I see. So this is a portion. <laughs> this is a, a portion from uh, another bottle cap that we found in this. This is a different bird, but I'm just kind of showing you what they look like in the environment. Um, this is another white piece of plastic it was found in, an, in another bird. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I guess let's turn it over for questions. I, I think I think we're we're at 20 minutes, and so. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hold up the uh, the plastics again for everyone to see, but at this point, I'd love to hear from the classes and uh, see what, what kind of questions we can answer. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much, Anna. Uh, as usual, what a unique presentation. And uh, again, even though it wasn't the best connection, really, really cool stuff. I have linked the other video in the chat if you guys want to see some of those organs more up close. Uh, but let's dive in. We've got six live classes doing us from across North America, some more joining on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube or Facebook, let me know where you're joining from. Share your questions. I'd love to take as many as we can. What I want to do to begin is start in grade 12 biology in Nova Scotia. Uh, so we're going to head to Miss... Um, sorry, we're going to head to Miss Trenholm's class. You guys have a question for us? Come on in. <laughs> there we go. Double the <laughs> Perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, we have a question. Do you want to come over? No. Do you want to just tell me the question? How many birds do you dissect a year? Perfect. Um, it depends. So in total, I've dissected about... 400 over the past three years. Um, I probably dissect maybe between 80 and 150 per year. It kind of depends on how much time I have to do it. Yeah. Good wow. question. <laughs> yeah, great start, guys. I love it. And don't be shy. You can come up to the camera if you'd like to. <laughs> I know high schoolers are a little reluctant, but that's what the good teachers are for. So Mr. Kim's class joining us in Owen Sound, Ontario, grade 11s. Welcome in, guys. I just demute your mic and you're good to go. Hey, Mr. Kim. Hi. Right. So, uh, a question that do you we have. Any have questions for us? Yeah, do you guys ever see any scarring inside of the the birds, like in their intestines or their stomach, because the plastic has been scratching them up at all? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I've actually, um, like, in in terms of scarring, I probably haven't seen too much scarring, but I found a few birds that this um, this this ventriculus portion. 
I don't, I, I'm sorry, it's blurry, y'all. Um, this ventriculus portion, it's actually already exploded in the bird. The bird died because it was packed with so many plastics. There was about um, 200 plastics in some of those different birds. And so scarring, I'm not sure if, if we would notice that might be, as, as you guys are kind of seeing from, um, or you, as you guys are kind of seeing from the, the process here, it's all kind of like bloody and soft, but we, we do find some that they're just exploded from, from the amount of plastics that, that are in there. Um, but yeah, great question. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So Anna, I just want to follow up on the exploded bit. Is it something that only happens when they pack themselves with the plastics or is it other food that they could like just eat too much in general? Or how do we know that the plastics causing that? Yeah, no, it, it, it's the plastics. There's been, um, I, so to qualify, I've only found a few that were like that. They washed up dead on a beach. Um, it's mm. it's the, the plastics for sure. The squid beaks that they would naturally have in their stomach, they break down at a, a kind of a, a normal rate that the birds are accustomed to. And so they pass out of the system, uh, the bird system faster than the plastics as, as far as we know. While the plastics, they degrade at a much slower rate, or so we think, and so they're sticking around in there and kind of blocking that little organ, that, that tiny organ, from processing all the other things that are supposed to be passing through the bird's GI tract. And so um, the, the squid beaks, if they eat a ton of squid beaks, they know how to digest those. If they eat a ton of plastics, it's not quite the same. Yeah, um, Great. yeah that, that I think is, is the, the best answer to that. Yeah, that's perfect. I just wanted to clarify for all the students. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to go to Ms. Rambert in class in Toronto in a second, but I want to take a grade nine class from Ms. Verdones in Guelph right now. Do you only dissect seabirds or other birds as well? And I'll, I'll even add more to that. Do you dissect other animals as well in general, or is it just these guys? Yeah, great question. Um, I just dissect these guys. Um, I have dissected other types of seabirds in the past. I really focus on seabirds because as I, I think I, I mentioned in the little presentation, they're great sentinels of the environment. So instead of going out on a ship and, and taking a bunch of water samples and, and toes across the ocean, I can just look at the seabirds that are living in that environment. So I really focus on seabirds and particularly this type of seabird because I have a lot of them on hand. This type of seabird is abundant in the area where I work. Um, they also happen to be caught as bycatch a lot as well as wash shore and kill any birds at all for my project I get these already dead and so these this type of this species is, is the the type I get the most of um, but great question there are plenty of other folks who explore plastics in uh, marine mammals and in plankton and in fish um, and those those are, are also really important research subjects but I'm, I'm just a bird gal <laughs> Uh, it's a really exciting time in ocean plastic research, and I want to highlight that for all our classes. Most of the work done in the field has been done in the last 20 years, and most of that's been done in the last five. This is something that we're really seeking to understand, uh, you know, around the world with labs around the world um, right now. So it's, uh, there's, there's new information every day. We featured a lot of that on our broadcast for the last few weeks. So do follow up on this broadcast with even more of us. There's some really exciting stuff out there on what's being found. Let's go to Ms. Rambaran's class. As I said, in Toronto, welcome in, guys. Just demute your microphone and you're uh, good to go. Perfect. Oh. oh no, you're muted. I can't. No, so you're unmuted. It's not true. Did you yeah. I didn't quite catch Yeah, no. So, Ms. Rambler, I'm sorry to ask if you can that in the chat bar. Again, your audio is really iffy for a reason. You know, half the fun of these are technical difficulties. So, Ms. Rambler, type that in. Thanks to the student for asking the question, and we will share it as soon as we possibly can, okay? I love um, the mask, by the way. That was super cute. Yeah, best mask ever. It's been half the fun of these broadcasts this month. Um, so, Ms. Coolin, I'm going to come to you in just a second. I want to take a question from Julia in Vancouver, BC. So, she wants to know, what's the biggest piece of plastic you found, and how do you know what it was from? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, a couple memorable items. Um, I find a lot of bottle caps. Um, you can tell that they're bottle caps. Let me see if I – actually, this one that we just found might be a bottle cap. Yeah, this is a bottle cap. Um, so this this one that we just pulled out of the seabird, right here, this little green thing, 
Um, it might be too blurry to tell, but there's striations on the inside of it, meaning like ridges or bumps that if you think about like the bottle of a, or the top of a Coke bottle, um, that's, that's what you see in the bird and it's reflected. And so the, um, the top portion of the bottle cap caves in and just the, the thick sides are left. And we find so many bottle caps. That's like the number one item we find. The biggest piece we've ever found, um, we believe it was the heel of a shoe. And it was probably about, I want to say close to like a, a centimeter. Um, I think it was precisely like 11 or 12 millimeters in length. So it's a, a pretty significant piece of, of plastic. Um, and we believe it was the heel of a shoe based on kind of its curvature. And you could start to see a brand name um, or like in, engraving on it. And so we, we think it was the rubber, the rubber portion of a shoe, but great, great question. Yeah. Now that the rubber shoe might be the answer to this. So Ms. Rambran students, thanks for typing in questions. So one of the first questions was what's the worst thing you've seen in a bird? So if that's the same answer, I can take the next question. Um, so I have to, I have to add to that because we see or when they eat balloons, um, the balloons disintegrate and become kind of this like tar sort of thing. And that rubbery tar stuff gets all through, it, it catches in their GI tract or their, their whole stomach. And it also, it coats all of the natural items in their stomach and it makes those natural items even harder to break down. And so balloons are probably the most dangerous thing that we see them eating. There's some previous work before I started this that found that balloons are, are the plastic thing most likely to cause the death of a seabird. So when, when we find those, there's it's just everywhere kind of throughout throughout their stomach contents. Um, but yeah, that that big piece, that like shoe heel, that was that was pretty bad too, just because it's so big. Um, it's hard to show scale in a video, but these birds aren't aren't very big. They're you know like they're the size of um, my my forearm. Um, so they're, they're not huge. And to think of them eating such a big piece of plastic is, is pretty jarring, but great question. Thank you. Yeah. And balloons is something that's been brought up a lot. So I just want to take a, a second to mention that, you know, we all love balloons. A lot of us have had those for birthday party celebrations. It is a lot of fun. If you're going to have balloons, great. Just make sure you keep them inside. Uh, a lot of people have balloons outside and they fly away and they fly away to the ocean or to lakes or to rivers and to be ingested by animals. So if you're going to have balloons, fantastic. Uh, we know that that's a big part of a lot of people's celebrations, but just use them responsibly. Uh, as silly as that may sound, it's a really important step to helping protect seabirds. Let's go to Miss Cool in class, grade nine. If you guys want to come in and ask a question, you're good to go. Just Turn on that camera, unmute your mic, and you're all set. Perfect, guys. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, is, is there a way to kind of, do you have volunteers with students that you sometimes get maybe before the whole pandemic that they are able to kind of help out with everything that you do? Yeah. So um, I have a number of volunteers who help me necropsy the birds or dissect the birds over the um, over the course of the project, we've probably had about 10, 10 to 12 volunteers, um, a mix of, of students as well as other scientists to just take a couple days and, and come help. Um, but, but great question, yeah. Um, the, the benefit of working with birds is they're, they're pretty manageable to work with. So one person can, can work on them and, and help contribute. And it'll be, because um, we're not, we're, you know, we're, we're looking for a specific thing in these, it, it also it goes pretty fast. Um, which is is definitely uh, a benefit. So yeah, we, we do take volunteers and students and that sort of thing. Fantastic, great question, guys. One of the things we love to highlight in high school sessions in general is that it's exactly that sort of thing that leads to a lot of people ending up in their careers. Volunteer, intern, get involved. If you find someone that's doing work that you're interested in, reach out to them. Most scientists don't bite, some do, um, but you can always uh, reach out and, and get inspired and work with people and, and find new career paths yourself. So uh, whatever grade you're in, grade nine through 12, anywhere before that even, uh, lots of opportunities out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah Kathy, sorry. Let me let me augment that. I actually had a high school um, volunteer for a couple of weeks, and she was she was awesome. Um, and she contributed a lot to helping me count all these plastics in the birds. So uh, for the high school folks out there, don't hesitate to reach out to a local university or science center near you. Um, we're I I hope I don't want to speak for all scientists, but generally we're always looking for help. So so please don't hesitate to to reach out. 
Fantastic. I like the caveat. All scientists, you know, writing you an email. Please don't ever say that again. <laughs> uh, let's go to Miss Ryan's class, uh, grade nine. Welcome in, guys. If you have a question for us, come on in. I know you've been typing some in the chat bar, but you've got great audio, so why not ask it in person? Much more fun that way. So DCVI, uh, if you guys want to demute your mic, you're good to go. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Um, just so you know, I have grade 11s. We're environmental science. Um, cool. So some of our questions... So yeah, so some of our questions are going to be about um, the plastics and what we can do and, and where your research is going. But the first question was um, about, can you identify where the plastics are mostly coming from and, and where is the biggest like a, biggest source right now of plastics? Yeah, great question. So that's something we're working on in the scope of this project. Um, we believe because these birds... The, the area in the South Atlantic where they spend half of their time is much more remote than the area in the North Atlantic where they spend the rest of their time. So we believe that the North Atlantic is probably more of the source. They don't really forage in between their two areas. They're kind of like North and South. And so when they come to the North Atlantic off the coast of Massachusetts, they're ravenous, they're eating a lot, um, as well as when they're, you know, when they're breeding in the South Atlantic, they're eating a lot. And so we believe because the North Atlantic is closer to a lot of human populations, they're probably getting more plastic there. In terms of specific sources, um, we also believe because of how many bottle caps that we do find, it's probably um, you know land-based plastics that are mismanaged and making it out to sea, um, or they are plastics discarded from ships and um, kind of left to degrade in the environment. We're not finding, you know, intact bottle caps. So whatever it is that they're, you know, wherever they're getting from, the plastic has had time to degrade in the environment into these little fragments. Additionally, um, on these plastic fragments, we take a number of measurements. We take uh, length, width, weight, and thickness, as well as do an analysis of what type of plastic it is. So most of the birds are eating polyethylene and polypropylene. They're two of the most common types of plastics. So 90% of the plastics that they eat are recyclable. So um, we, we, do, we do know that. And we're also, some of the measurements are helping us kind of support this idea that they're land-based plastics. If they were entirely from sea sources and like ship sources, they would probably be a little thicker. So we, we think that based on like the size, the length, width, and, and thickness of the plastics, that's where we're, we're getting this hypothesis of land-based mismanaged plastics, unfortunately. Um, I, I think that touches on your question. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about the origins of plastics, we've covered that in a lot of our broadcasts recently. So check on our YouTube channel. They're all there. Um, and our story map that we created this year for the Ocean Plastics presentation. I'll link that to everyone when we're done. Um, Anna, this has been great. Do you have another time for another round of questions? We're sort of whipping yeah. through. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go back to Lower Sackville, Nova Scotia. If you guys have another question for us, come on up. And uh, yeah, Jimmy, your mic, you're good to go. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay, we had a little tech issue there. Um, we did have another question about um, what can we do as citizens to help this problem of the fact that the sea birds are eating plastics? Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and any, any yeah, no, totally. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks so much for asking because plastics are a uh, they're. They're much more easy to manage compared to some other stressors in the environment. And so something that's really important is um, reducing the amount of plastic that you incorporate in your life. If you have a chance or have the choice between a plastic bottle and a glass bottle, take the glass reusable bottle. Um, reuse plastic um, rather than kind of discarding it as much as possible. It's really important to think about refuse, reduce, and recycle. You, none of those in individually is going to solve the problem, but if you kind of use them all together, we can, we can really kind of start to address this for these birds. So yeah, number one, reduce the amount of plastic that you consume, because while you may do your best to make sure it gets managed properly, sometimes things happen and it might not. And so by refusing and reducing at your individual level, that's really important. The second thing is I would encourage you to participate in 
um, cleanups of your watershed if you live near a creek or a river or a coastline. We most of the plastics that these birds are eating, we believe, are coming from land sources, and this doesn't mean just land sources right on the coast. Um, you know, I, I always quote Finding Nemo. You know, all drains lead to the ocean, so stuff from way, way upstream can be getting washed downstream into the ocean, and so cleaning up your watersheds um, is is a really key part of, of getting plastic out of the system before it makes it into these birds' guts. So th those I think are, are my, my number one tips. Um, there's a bunch of great resources uh, available I know through through this program as well as online through uh, the Marine Debris Program as well as the Five Geyers Institute. So you know, check out some of those as well for, for other ideas about how you can address the issue. Fantastic. We actually have a NOAA presentation happening at 12 Eastern today. So if you want to check that out as a compliment to this, you can do so. Um, I'm going to take two quick questions that have been typed in by our classes, and then I'll come to Ms. Uh, Kuhn, uh, our Mr. Kim's class, in just a second. So really quick questions. Uh, Ms. Rambrand's class, why did you choose to detect seabirds, Anna? What led you to this? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, this is just one of those things. You know, I love seabirds. I love the dissection process. Um, I, I did it uh, a couple years back at the beginning of my PhD, and I was kind of hooked. It also, as I mentioned, they're great sentinels or indicators of the marine environment. So it was kind of an alignment of like, oh my gosh, I totally love this. And this is really useful. I'm getting good information. So that um, that was maybe how I particularly focused on seabirds. Um, and I, I just, I think it's so cool. And I know that maybe like a little weird because it's super bloody, but it's just so cool. You get so much information and um, it's it's important to figure out if, if these birds are eating and dying from it. I really, you know, I feel like I'm contributing and helping to describe the problem, which is just something I love. If any of our students today can find something that they're as passionate about as Anna is about cutting open seabirds, you're set for life. That's a great uh, way to be. And we love highlighting people that are as passionate as you. So thanks, Anna. Um, all right. Let's take another question from uh, one of our groups typing in. So Ms. Ragone's class wanted to know, so you, you mentioned 98% of the seabirds you've cut open have plastic inside them. That's absolutely alarming. Do we know what percentage of the birds die from that plastic that's inside them? Is there a way of quantifying that? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, work not for me, another group, I think they're from Australia. Uh, they did a number of kind of statistic modeling approaches to figure out what's the likelihood of dying from plastic for seabirds because, you know, the ones I get, they're already dead. So I can't necessarily tell what happens to the bird after I count the number of plastics in their stomach, obviously. Um, but this, this other group, uh, they did a bunch of kind of statistics and they figured out that once a bird exceeds um, 20 pieces of plastic in its stomach, its chance of mortality from plastics jumps, I believe, 90%. Uh, it's a, I don't, don't take that to the bank. Uh, I can, if anyone's interested, please contact me. I'll send you the, the paper that, that explains it. But once they have 20 pieces, it, it jumps about 90%. Most of the birds I cut open have about um, anywhere from eight to 12 pieces. So they're a little below that. But I wanna point out all the birds that I cut open, um, I'd say about 90 to 95% of them are first year birds, meaning they were just born. And so the birds live for 40 or 50 years over the rest of their lifetime, they can accumulate a lot of plastics. And so in terms of what percentage are, are dying, not totally sure. Some best estimates tell us that um, once they go beyond a certain number, it's more likely. Um, in terms of how it's impacting this species, that's something we're hoping to figure out with this with this project. So maybe next year I'll have uh, an update for, for that question. We'll, we'll bring all the classes back in just to check. Um, I know we're going a little long for our classes here. If you need to go for periods uh, ending, no, no worries. And you can always ask questions after the fact too. But I'm going to try and see if we can get rapid fire four more questions in. So Mr. Kim's class, uh, grade 9 and 10, if you guys want to come on up and ask one more, go for it. So where do the birds come from? Like, Do you like go searching for the dead birds or does someone bring them to you? Yeah, yeah great question. So um, this... I get them from, from two different sources. Um, a lot of birds wash up um, on beaches that, that kind of die and they float because they're so full of fat. 
So they float, they wash up on beaches. I get all those birds through kind of connections in my region. As well, um, as a NOAA Nancy Foster Scholar, I have a connection to the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program. It is a program here in the US where um, folks go out on fishing boats and kind of quantify what gets caught in the nets in addition to target species. Sometimes these birds get caught in those nets. And so the, the folks on those fishing boats grab the bycatch birds for me, they stick them in a bag and bring them back for me to cut up and, and look for plastic in. So two different sources, um, both of them already dead though. Yep, fantastic guys, great question. I'm glad we got that one in. Um, Ms. Coolen's class, if you guys have a question for us, come on in and uh, ask away. And then DCVI, I'll wrap up with you guys in just a second. Uh, appreciate you guys sticking around. Yeah, Ms. Coolen's group, you're good to go. Okay, what did you take as your undergrad and where did you do it? Yeah. Oh, great question. So. Um, for my undergrad, I did marine biology and chemistry at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Um, I then I got a master's in water quality at the same place, University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Now I'm finishing up my PhD um, at the University of Rhode Island. Overall, I've just, like, since high school, I guess, actually, I've really been interested in just different kinds of pollution. And so I've, throughout kind of my, my whole academic career, I've focused on different kinds of pollution and, and water quality. And it, it led it led me to the birds. <laughs> uh, one thing you mentioned that I want to just highlight for our students, especially grade 11 and 12, is that you went to different universities. You're at a, a different place now. And it's pretty much universal that when we have people on this broadcast that they've had experiences at places all around the US, all across Canada, all around the world. Uh, so those sort of unique experiences, different ways of looking at problems, different people that you can work with, tend to be a really key trait in people that are doing some really cool work. So that's just something to note as you guys are you know, approaching university for yourselves uh, and something to consider. Let's head back to BCBI for one last question come on in guys if you want to wrap us up uh would love to hear from you guys hey thanks jesse um anna so these guys were we've looked at a lot of climate change issues and plastic is just starting to come up in our study so we've only been in class this is our eighth day um, okay. together. um what we're going to be working on is identifying a problem related to climate climate change or stresses on habitat and then coming up with an action and a challenge and following through um, before our course ends in November. So I guess, so a couple of questions pertaining to their work is what are you gonna do with your research and what would you like to see happen? Great question, thanks, thanks for asking. So um, number one, I am trying to get a best estimate of kind of a baseline of how much plastic are in these birds. Um, in the previous question, I mentioned that we get a lot of dead birds of this particular species. And so that means over the next 10, 20 years, as we keep tabs on the ocean plastic problem, we have a sample set that we can kind of take a time series on and, and figure out if they're getting more plastic or less plastic. So um, number one, I wanna have, have this be used in a time series to keep tabs on it. Number two, um, we're doing, as I mentioned, polymer assessment where we're looking at these fragments and figuring out what type of plastic is included here. Um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, right now we know it's mostly recyclable plastics. So I hope to, to broadcast that information so um, folks realize to, to better recycle, make sure your stuff's recycled, make sure your, your waste is properly managed um, so that we, we, don't, we don't end up finding it here in the birds. And so those are, those are kind of my, my twofold aims uh, for, for this particular data set. Yeah. Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much to all our classes for some really thoughtful questions today. I know we went a little bit long, uh, but we really appreciate you sticking around. If you have more questions, Anna, is there a place that people can get in touch with you to ask more if they're keen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jesse, please feel free to share my email address. Right. Um, you, you, I, I know you have it at this point. So uh, any of the classrooms, uh, particularly um, you know, some of the, the questions about where you can go from here, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, this is a highlight of my year doing this event. So I, I love following up with classrooms um, afterwards. So please shoot me an email. I'm, I'm happy to chat and help. Will do. So thank you so much for that, Anna. Not many of our speakers do that. So I really appreciate that. Highlight of your year is a big, you're the second person to say that so far. We're just going for highlight of everyone's years, apparently. Um, well, I want to bring in all our classes, Mr. Kim, uh, Ms. Verdone, DCVI. If you guys want to just say a big thank you to uh, Anna for joining us today, you're all connected. I'll end the broadcast there, but have a wonderful